the novelist Aldous Huxley once wrote that most human beings behave as though death were no more than an unfounded rumour. But what happens when you realise the rumour is true? Let's face it, none of us, until it hits us in the face, think we're going to die. I can still sort of picture the consultant's room. He said, well, I've got some bad news for you. We think you've got motor neuron disease. As we film this, Richard Chell has only months to live. His comfort lies in his religious faith. For him, death is not the end. Death, to me, the actual process of dying is not something I'm scared of. For me, it's uh, going through a door into another, another room. What did you mean by that? I'm a Christian, and therefore I do believe in a life after death. I do believe that this life is just part of a process, and that there's another part of that process to complete. Um, I know very well your, your feelings about religion and, and the rest of it, but I would say having a view that is finite is a bit like having half a meal. Um, it will leave you hungry at the end of the day. But of course the existence of hunger doesn't mean that there's food. No, but it means there's a need. There's certainly And I a would need. argue that yeah. there is a food. If you face the situation where, like myself, say, you were suddenly said, well, look, death is fairly close and you're going to die. Do you think you would feel any differently? Or are you clear in your own mind if, if that was the situation, I know exactly how I'd respond and exactly how I'd feel? It is a fair question. I follow reason and I don't believe in God. But this series is not about whether God exists or not. It's about a more difficult problem. What, if anything, can take God's place? Religion has shaped our understanding of life for thousands of years. Ideas of the soul, sin, and the afterlife are hard to shake off, even for non-religious people like me. As more and more of us realize there is no God, what happens as we leave religion behind? I have to believe there's a plan and that God is going to accomplish something through this. I suppose Jesus is an unpaid babysitter. It's like, if I'm not watching you, Jesus is. So do you think that we in the West are too materialistic? I think so. In this film, Death, religion has traditionally been thought to bring comfort at the end of life. But does it really? What can science and reason tell us? How does someone like me, who has no religion, face death? Varanasi, India, one of the oldest cities in the world. It has a macabre speciality. Its main business is the industry of death. Every year a million Hindu pilgrims visit Varanasi, dragging with them some 40,000 corpses to be cremated on the banks of the Ganges. This is the holiest place in the whole of Hinduism. And this is the place where Hindus aspire to come to die, uh, to escape from the cycle of birth and death and rebirth. It is a most amazing scene. It's probably been going on like this for centuries, even millennia. It looks as though there are ashes down here in the, in the river swirling around. As an atheist for whom death is a full stop, I suppose I shouldn't feel sentimental about the carcasses. 
They are ex-people who have ceased to be. Yet I find something a little bit shocking here. The partially burnt corpses. The locals casually searching for precious metals in the burnt remains. And the rejected dead. Although this is clearly steeped in religion, there's a surprising lack of evident reverence or solemnity. The people standing around the funeral pyres are doing a job of work in a pretty matter-of-fact way. But there is a kind of logic behind the apparent lack of reverence. In this religious tradition, the flesh is no longer important. What matters here is releasing the spirit or soul. This is where religion plays its strongest card. The body may not live forever, but the soul does. On the face of it, it's a comforting idea and a challenge for an atheist like me. If you want to hear the challenge starkly expressed, you can go to a place like this in Kansas City. Hello, I'm Richard. This Catholic hospice, Alexandra's house, is for babies who die within hours of birth. These are clearly fatal disorders. Babies perhaps with anencephaly, Potter syndrome, where they have no kidneys, uh, severe genetic heart disease. So they're all going to die, and they're so going to die. the normal recommendation by the medical profession would probably be a, an abortion at that yes. point, This may, you know, be hard for some people to see. These are many of our babies for whom we've cared, uh, some who have lived here, but all of them that we've cared for. And so this is leading us up to where the families stay. This is where the parents stay. Over the last 11 years, Patty Lewis has helped the families of over 500 babies who've died within these walls. Do you think that mothers are ever going to meet their babies again? Yes. Uh, I think the mothers believe that too, and the fathers, yes. and the siblings. I do sympathize with the desire to meet again somebody whom you've known and loved, but a newborn baby. I feel very sorry for these parents, but still, reality may be raw, but we have to face it. The baby was born on Saturday, which 7, is, 9, 11. Which is yesterday. Yeah. And she came into the world at 6 p.m. and she lived 30 minutes. And those 30 minutes seemed so short and so precious. Um, we held her and loved her and got to give her a little bath and put her in a christening outfit and we baptized her and um, the family was there with us and it was a very precious time. Can you talk us through when you first found out that there was a problem with the baby? Uh, we found out in January that we were expecting and it would be our third. We were overjoyed and we go in for ultrasound to find out if it was a boy or a girl. She did the scan and told us there were no kidneys, and that was no the kidneys, right? They, that was the first time that we had heard that diagnosis, and she called it a lethal pregnancy. So that's when you sort of went into shock, is it? More so, yes. yes. Did it occur to you that the, the total sum of suffering would be much less if you drew a line under it then and restarted your life? You've got to restart your life now. Um, why did you decide to go on for the remaining months? Well, there's hope in everything, and God can do great things. And so you, you were hoping for a miracle? Mm -hmm. Hoping for a miracle, but if it wasn't, it was still going to be precious, and it's a baby, and it's a life, and it's not my decision to terminate that. It's not my choice, and 
um, I carried it and loved it and, and could feel it move every single day. And, and also the 30 minutes or so that we got to spend with her was, was worth, I didn't have any of the pain, and, but I would say it was worth all of the, the trial of getting to where we were. Not only did we get to spend 30 minutes with her, we got to, we got to be with her for like 12 hours. You know, she wasn't with us spiritually, but we got to hold her. And, and, and you took photographs? Oh, mm -hmm. yes. We have one that we printed off. She was beautiful. She was perfect. Everything looked just like her mom right down to her fingernails. <laughs> yes, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have changed it for anything. Do you think you'll ever meet the baby? Oh, of course. There's great hope in that. We will meet the baby. It's in heaven with God. I feel for Renee and Lee. They sincerely think they're gaining reassurance from their faith. So now I need to understand how this relationship between death and religion has evolved to be so strong. Religion denies death is real. It sets up instead the forbidding prospect of eternity, either in heaven or worse, in hell. For me, what's frightening is not death itself, but eternity, whether you're there or not. Yet people still reach instinctively for religion and its rituals when it comes to the end. Why? It's a very, very artificial situation. We see the person lying down. Unless you're intimately acquainted with someone, you don't really see them lying down. And they may well be dressed in their own clothes, lying down with their eyes closed in an artificial situation that they're inside a wooden box. Now, all of these things uh, bring a surrealism, but despite that, people are very, very focused on the fact that the last physical connection that they have with that person is lying in that coffin, and that's what they're saying farewell to. So why do people go on with these strange rituals? It's the business of walking away from the funeral and feeling that was well done, we liked what they've done for us, and we feel that we led someone whom we cared about very deeply to rest in a very dignified and meaningful way. Even if the beautiful oak coffin is then burned or buried, somehow you feel you've given the person a good send-off. Uh, very much so. More and more of us have no faith in God, but we cling to the rituals. Even in secular woodland burial sites, we find death brings illogical superstition. It is fascinating to see people thinking of themselves as part of this place. They're anticipating their post-mortem identity. So that when people talk about, as they can in this place, face in any direction, so some want to look up the hill, some want to look down the hill, some want to look towards the sun, they are buried in different spatial directions. Douglas Davies is an anthropologist fascinated by the fuss and trappings surrounding death. Do you think part of what's going on is a reluctance to believe that the dead person is really dead? Yes, one lady, her father used to farm around here, and so he's been buried looking up towards the hill, because he used to shoot rabbits up there and the like. And to her this is dreadfully important because the relatives too are thinking about their dead after they've died. Yes. I find I'm not immune to these notions. There's a place in Cornwall where uh, my mother's family come from, uh, and where we used to spend childhood holidays called Dollar Cove. And I think I'm right in saying that's the place where there's a little tiny church. Uh, more is on the beach, more is built in the sand. And I've sometimes fantasised about being buried there, somehow with the sea crashing in mm. and the tide coming in and out. What is the allure that would be there for you 
in a location for your yeah, body. It's totally illogical. It's pure sentimentality. Um, I suppose uh, there, there's no rational defence for it, whatever. I mean, one should say just stick, stick me in a dustbin bag and throw me away. I mean, but you don't want to be in a dustbin no, bag. No, that's right. And, and it is pure sentiment. I mean, we are sentimental animals yes, as, well as, as, well as, uh, as well as social animals. So why do even atheists like me carry around this sentimental baggage? When did these illogical thoughts first develop? As a child, I don't think I worried about God looking down at me and seeing what I was doing. I worried about ancestors. I worried about my great uncles and great aunts looking down from heaven and seeing everything that I did. Childish, perhaps, but don't let's be too quick to dismiss it. Hello, Iggy. Oops. <laughs> he doesn't want to come out of the way. <laughs> okay, look out. From an early age, we start to believe that there's more to us than just our physical bodies. As this experiment reveals. Should we give him a little tickle? He's very sweet, isn't he? Okay. This is a fake machine to fool children into thinking live beings can be duplicated. There's Iggy. And there's Iggy. As scientists, we seem to be committed to the view that if you could take a person and make an exact copy, molecule by molecule, that copy would have exactly the same thoughts and memories, would be the same person. But intuition rebels. We seem to want to believe that there's some essence of ourselves, something that would not go across with all those molecules, something that a religious person might want to call a soul. This is an attempt to look at an old philosophical problem, which is imagine if you could copy anything. And um, what we've done in these experiments, rather than getting children to imagine it, we, we produce uh, a machine which looks as if it can duplicate and copy anything, a bit like a photocopier for objects. Now it's two. It made two. It made two. We've shown in previous studies that they believe it can copy toys very easily. But the question is, would they really extend that to something like a living thing, like a hamster? And should we tell them your name? Do you want to whisper? And so what copies over is the body of the hamster, the um, ideas of the hamster, the memories of the hamster? We believe that the intuition is that the physical object can be copied and therefore the physical body can be copied. But we're not so sure that children think that the mind can be copied. Just like adults, they have this sense that maybe the mind is different to the physical body. Now, the reason this is really interesting is because if you believe that the mind is separate to the physical body, then it means that if the body goes, then maybe the mind can stay on and exist. And of course, this allows for all sorts of notions of, of spirits and the soul as being something entirely untethered to the physical yes, world. So disembodied ghosts uh, after death or surviving death in, in, in other ways. The, the soul goes on. So these young children believe bodies can be copied, but not minds. Shall we have a look? One. Two. Two. <laughs> They are already thinking there's something in charge of each being that is unique. Something like a soul. Did this hamster see your picture? Yeah. Does this hamster know what your picture is? No. Does this hamster know your name? Does this hamster know your name? No. Evolutionary psychology suggests that we have evolved a sense of separate mind or soul because it's useful to us. Because the experience of being in control of your body is so pervasive, you just feel that you've, you've made a decision, you're going to have a cup of coffee, these things, you feel like you're driving this very complex yes, machine. Yes, you certainly do. And if you didn't feel like that, you mm. wouldn't really be very well adapted to that. No, world. that's right. I mean, to be a, f a fully functional animal, which is what, what we, our ancestors were, um, hunting and feeding and running and escaping from predators, you need to feel it like a soul that's in control of the body.
This is one reason why it's so hard to shake off the religious way of death. We are programmed to believe in something like a soul. Now, of course, I don't believe in a soul, but I too have the feeling that there is some sort of essence of Richard Dawkins that makes me who I am, that gives me my unique personal identity. To understand more about this, I need to look at the role our memories play with the person who's known me longest, my mother. So what have we got here? We've got um, your first birthday, first party. birthday party. Yes. Well, I've no memory of this at no. all. That's presumably me, is it? Yes, that's you, in a little dress that your granny sent out from <laughs> England. Our memories are hugely important to our sense of who we are. That's Kilimanjaro. Oh yes. You used to like saying words like Kilimanjaro. Oh, right. But our memories lull us into a false sense of certainty. They are fallible, riddled with errors. Another early memory was being stung by a scorpion. Yes, we were miles, absolutely miles from anywhere, and you suddenly jumped off your chair without your shoes on, which you weren't allowed to do, and stepped on a scorpion. And Ali, our African boy, rushed in and got your foot and squeezed it and suck, sucked Gosh, it. Gosh, good for Ali. Yes. Sucked it for hours. Yes. Well, not hours, um, but... And you were screaming. We had to hold you while he sucked your foot. Yes. I, I, my memory is slightly different. It, mm. my, my memory is that I was walking along the floor and I saw this creature walking a, across. Yeah. And I thought it was a lizard. Really? And I put my... F I didn't step on it. I put my foot in the way of it to really? let it crawl over my uh, foot. You you jumped off your chair. Mm. I don't you... remember the pain. Don't you? Isn't that no. interesting? Because mm. that was a terrible bit. We think back to our first memory, our first big adventure. And it's almost as though there was a movie camera in our head recording every detail. But that's not the way it is. That's an illusion. What we're remembering is a memory of a memory of a memory of perhaps the real thing. A man may wear a wristwatch when he's 20 and the same watch when he's 50. It's the same watch, but is not the same man inside. Every atom in his body has changed, has turned over. I'm not the child I once was. The child I once was is dead. So the physical cells that once made me are long gone and my memories are more tenuous than I would wish. The connection between younger Richard Dawkins and older Richard Dawkins isn't as strong as I might like it to be. And I think this is why the religious idea of something permanent, the soul, is so plausible. Now I want to explore the reality of why we die. Religion still dominates our thinking about death. If we get rid of God, what's left? I'm on a voyage to tell you the extraordinary truth that science reveals about death. According to evolutionary science, death is not something to be overcome at all. It's a necessary part of the picture. I'm joining the scientists on board Bangor University's research vessel on the Irish Sea. Yeah, yeah. So where do you put that on? They're studying the lifespan of a species of clam called Arctica Icelandica. They may look rather ordinary, but they have one attribute that is really quite amazing. These clams are among the longest living animals on Earth. Save that one or not? Yeah. 
the reason why we're so interested in this is that this is a, a very long lived species. We can pull it up from the wild and we can assign a year almost, you know, to within one year of how old it is. Basically, the shell grows in incremental steps. Each ring is an annual ring. So the growth is very much like, like a tree. And can you guess from this one how old it is? There's a size growth curve. Yeah. And this is probably 80 to 150 years old. The oldest of them reach what sort of age? Um, around the UK, it's around 220 years. Right. Um, up in Iceland, in the far north, they'll be hit 350, 400, maybe yeah. even 500 years. Yeah. Only recently, this research team found a clam that had lived for more than half a millennium. It's amazing to think that some of these clams that we're dredging up were born before Darwin, even before Elizabeth I. So why do they live so long? Any evolutionary explanation of why ageing happens has to do two things. It has to be able to explain why you see ageing in many species. It also has to be able to explain why you see enormously long lifespans or possibly no ageing in a very few species. And the clams, I think, may be an example of this because you've seen them and handled them for yourselves. They have enormously thick shells. I don't think there are very many things down there that can actually bite through them. And so they can sit around and they can just carry on producing offspring once they've reached a certain size. These clams are continuing to pass on their genes to the next generation even at 200 and 300 years old. So from the evolutionary point of view, it's not just that the individuals are, are well protected against being eaten. Because they're well protected against being eaten, it's a good gamble to stay alive a long, a long time mm -hmm. because you've got a good chance of reproducing later. Whereas something like a salmon um, has a very poor chance of reproducing again. So it might as well throw everything it's got into one big gamble now. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly it. There is no point in spending resources to make a body that will last 400 years if your chance of making it through the night is pretty slim. So, evolutionary science tells us a lot about aging and death. The clams are able to reproduce when they are hundreds of years old. And so long as they are able to reproduce, their genes keep them alive. We need to see death from a gene's eye point of view. Our bodies are survival machines for genes. Once our genes have got us to reproductive age and copied themselves into a new generation, our bodies have less purpose. Time bombs inside us go off. We age. We die. So, rather than looking upon aging as a wearing out of the body, perhaps we should see it as a side effect of how our genes work. Even extraordinary exceptions throw light on this truth. This is Irving Kahn, a financial trader on New York's Madison Avenue, who has come to work every day since 1927. Irving is 105 years old. Do you remember the Wall Street crash? Oh, yes, I came just at the time, about three or four months before the, the peak was the summer of 1928-29. And uh, that was one reason I didn't like the business. Yes. Because I came here, went to the exchange on Wall Street, and found after a week on the floor that it was like working in a casino. I can imagine. In a gaming house. Yes. I understand that not just you, but, but many members of your family are extremely yes. long-lived. My brother Peter is 103, 4, I'm not sure. Yes. I'm 105. Yeah. I have limited rental, but and limited hearsight, and I hope the right number 
of marbles is the thing. <laughs> You've got a lot of marbles, I think. What about your sister? How old is she? She's 108. Mr. Khan, is it possible to give us an idea of what it, what it feels like to be your age? It's much better and it's much worse. So why do some people's genes keep their bodies going for so much longer? The curious case of Irving Khan and his family has intrigued scientists who are trying to answer this very question. When we ask our people, you know, why do you think you live to be so old? One of the things they're saying, hey, it's in my family. My mother was 102, my grandfather was 108. Irvin can show that he has four other siblings that lived to be 100. The study looked at 500 aged Ashkenazi Jews, like Irving Khan, from the same geographical area whose environment and genes can be easily compared. For Irvin, and especially for, for his sister Helen, she's been smoking for 95 years. Two packs for 95 years. Which shows you that if you smoke for 95 years, you live long life. <laughs> no, <it laughs> I can doesn't. assure you, I can assure you that that's true. And Irvin have smoked for about 30 years in his life. So. The point here is that our centenarians, as a group, did not interact with the environment the way we tell, uh, the doctors tell their patients, that you have to watch your weight, you have to exercise, uh, you shouldn't smoke, and you should uh, drink one cup of alcohol a day, and, and all, all the things that we know to tell them. It doesn't matter for them. So for some, lifestyle and environment don't play as large a role as we've been told. But if Irving's genes hold the secret to long life, why hasn't evolution given us all genes like his? If there are genes that increase longevity out into the hundreds, why didn't natural selection favor those genes in, in our ancestral past? So I'll tell you, there's something very upsetting in, in this sense in our uh, group. First of all, a third of the centenarians in the world don't have children. Okay, so I, I don't know, is it, is it having children, raising them, rearing them, I, I, I don't know what, but the, the point is that there is some exchange between reproduction and aging. But also in my study, the centenarians had less kids on a much later age than my control population. So if the control population has three to five kids on average, our centenarians are 1.7 kids on average. And and so if you're thinking that way, we're losing longevity genes, right? Because in every generation, we populate more with the people who don't, with kids of the people who don't have longevity genes that have longevity genes. Our genes appear to trade long life for reproduction. Longevity seems to be connected to later reproduction or no children at all. So how long we live and why we die are dependent on our genes. And I'm about to look my own genetic code straight in the face. Advances in genetic science mean it is now possible for me to get my entire genome decoded. There's something very personal and intimate about it as well. I mean, this is something that is absolutely unique to me. There's never, ever been in the history of the world, nor ever will there be again, a genome which is the same as mine, or the same as yours, or, or the same as anybody else's. This new science is still in its infancy. I'm going to be one of just a dozen people in the world and the first person in Britain publicly to have their whole genome sequenced. What we're doing here is, is very new for us, actually, and it's actually very exciting for us. We're taking the genome of a, of a healthy person and we're asking what can we learn about that person. You know, what, it is your, your most important bit of information about you is your genome sequence. 
But on a, a serious note, of course, we may find information in your genome that has uh, clinical or, or health implications. Yes, I have thought about that. So let's go. Let's let's go and do it. Okay. So you've just be a little scratch when the, the needle goes in. Having my blood taken okay. is only the first stage in a complex process. Okay, so we're almost there. The most painless blood test I've ever had. <laughs> Having my genome decoded is, in effect, a way of narrowing down how and when I'm going to die. My journey to understand death has become personal. You have roughly 100 mutations which have been reported as being associated with a disease. I may be one of a handful of individuals in the world to have their genome sequenced, but before I find out my results, I'm off to meet the man who was first. And he isn't just anyone. He is one of the two men who made this new science possible, James Watson. Well, it's certainly a very beautiful thing. Yes. Together with Francis Crick, James Watson discovered that genes are digital codes written on DNA molecules. Watson and Crick's names will live forever, and Watson isn't shy about it. So now I realize I'm, you know, except for Hawking, the most famous scientist alive. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> yes. I've turned out to be helped by people looking at my DNA. In what uh, way? It revealed that uh, I have a, a genetic polymorphism which metabolizes drugs, and I have one which acts very slowly. So if I take a, a beta blocker, it's, it stays in my system for a week instead of going away for a day. Okay. And so I've been given them for, you know, to help control my blood pressure, and I went to sleep. <laughs> Watson took a personal risk in making his genome available for study, exposing all its imperfections to public scrutiny for the sake of advancing genetic research. You get great pleasure from ideas. No, I get pleasure from understanding. Yes. So understanding, everything falls into place when you understand. Yes. So mm. you move from... It's understanding, it's... Uh, gives you happiness, and I think it's one of the uh, unique human features, because it's not limited to me, but uh, it clearly, you know, when you're able to do, find out how to do something. This, for me, is what is so thrilling about science, understanding things, such as how the DNA molecule underlies all life on Earth. It's because Watson discovered the structure of DNA over half a century ago that today I'm able to have my own genome analyzed and understand what makes me live and how and when I might die. Today is a very special day for me. In 50 years, lots of people will be able to say this, but today I'm one of very few people who's had their entire genome sequenced. And today is the big day when I get to see the results. So, Richard, it's a long time since you were in Oxford and we took an armful of your blood. We've had a team busy working since then, trying to extract the DNA and reconstruct your genome. We take these fragments... To understand my genes, Gil McVeigh matches them against the human reference genome, a composite of anonymous donors that took 10 years to decode and construct. And what we're really interested in is not saying where you agree with this reference, but finding places where you differ. In that, we find over 4 million differences between your genome and that reference. We have about 50,000 variants we've seen in you for the very first time, completely new to science. It is extraordinary that this enormous quantity of data reveals incredibly precise details about me, elements of my private world that I've never shared with anyone before, or known myself. 
If you have a classic European mutation, that means you've got runny earwax. You've got another one which means that you can smell asparagus in your own urine. You've got a, another one that means you can taste broccoli. You know, they sound frivolous, but at the same time, they probably point to an evolutionary process. And that's probably to do with your ability to uh, detect toxins. You know, you, there are certain plants have different toxins across the world. There's local adaptation to the toxins that you would you need to be able to recognize to survive and that um, and I buried in my genome is the story of my own survival but also clues about how I may die do I have ticking time bombs in my genetic code you have roughly 100 mutations which have been seen before and in clinical settings and have been reported as being associated with a disease having these mutations doesn't mean you'll, you're definitely going to get the disease, it just alters your chance of getting that. These are the variants that you carry which have been associated with a whole range of common disorders, everything from cancer through to type 2 diabetes uh, through to schizophrenia. Let's just take um, an example of this. If you zoom in on chromosome 11, you've got a mutation which the literature tells you is associated or causes porphyria, which is uh, the disease that people hypothesized for a while caused the madness of King George. It's a nasty disease, you would know if you had it. You should have a, like a 70% chance of getting porphyry. So I've dodged that bullet, but there are other threats. It's so impressively precise. My genome reveals that if I smoked, I would have been in the most high risk group for developing lung cancer. Spike here of changes. Your genotype doubles your risk of getting lung cancer. But actually, the way it does it is through doubling your risk of smoking in a particular way. So this, this variant influences your risk of getting lung cancer because it changes the way people smoke. They smoke deeper breaths. They smoke closer to the end of the cigarette. But what it actually does is change your smoking How habits. How fascinating. Okay. Yeah, so so, it's, so it, it's picked up as a gene for lung cancer, but the method of transmission, the, the method of effect, is via smoking behaviour. Exactly. This raises the obvious question of whether you've ever smoked. Do you, do you like the smell of wood <laughs> no, smoke? No, I've, I've never smoked. That's good. So, but don't take up smoking, is my advice. It seems to me to be utterly astonishing that it's possible for scientists to take an, an individual and to detect these millions of digital pieces of information to actually read it out as though it was a computer disk. Well, here it is then. Here is your genome. <laughs> Look after it. Thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to have it. Um, and thank you so much for all the amount of work that you and your colleagues have, have put in. I mean, when I look at this, this little box here, I mean, what it contains is all the information necessary to make, not quite me, to make an identical twin of me. Uh, and I think that's a, an, an astonishing thought. And thank you very, very much for this. Been a pleasure. As we come to learn more about DNA, our relationship with death is bound to change. And as more of us have our genomes analyzed, will we be able to avoid those ticking time bombs contained in our codes that killed our ancestors after they've reproduced. This is my genome, my whole genome. And strangely enough, portions of my genome are behind that door. Behind there is the Dawkins family vault. This has been the Dawkins church since the 1720s, and in there, are 20 of my relations, many of them my ancestors, and they have contributed some of the genes that are inside this little silver box. At the top, next to the top there, Henry Dawkins, and then three down, his wife, Lady Juliana Dawkins, they are my four greats, my great, 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 great grandparents. One sixty-fourth of the genes inside this little silver box come from Henry. The bottom of this column here, the middle column, is another Henry, his son. He has contributed one thirty-second part of 
the genes inside this hard disk. Unfortunately, the door can't be opened. It hasn't been opened since, I think, 1919. They've lost the key. Nobody knows how to open it. There are some slots in there, but I should never occupy one unless they can get the door open. What would be rather nice would be if we could somehow post this disk in there to rest alongside my ancestors. But the genes, the set of instructions inside us, don't rest. Just as they have come from our ancestors before us, so too do they march on into our children and their children's children. Our genes are a kind of archive of the remote past, and they go through us to the remote future. Henry Dawkins may be my four greats grandfather, and he's put some genes in here. But my 200 million greats grandfather was a fish, and by the way, the same fish was your 200 million greats grandfather too. Amazingly, even he has put some genes in here, and they too have a chance of going on to the remote future. Our genes are, in a sense, immortal. That's not comforting in the way the soul is supposed to be, but it is a wonderful thought, and it is true. We may argue about whether we have an immortal soul that survives our death, but one thing science tells us for sure is that if there's anything that's immortal in our bodies, it is our genes. Take your own existential journey starting with our reading list. Discover more views on sex, death and the meaning of life by visiting channel4.com slash the meaning of life. And you can see the next and final episode of the series here on More 4 next Monday from 10. Next tonight, Embarrassing Bodies.